Shall we pray and ask the Holy Spirit to open up his word to us? And, uh, and I'll share. Father, the entrance of your word gives life and light, and it causes our faith to grow. And so we ask that your word would gain entrance into our hearts through all that you're speaking this morning. And may we be doers of the word, people who build on rock, not just hearers, people who build on sand. We ask for the, the courage to be like that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to get to share this morning. As, as Jackie said, I didn't expect to, but um, you know, this is a message I shared when we were in Thailand at the Home of Blessing, which is the, the, chill, the refuge home for girls that my parents-in-law run there. And when I shared this message, I had a sneaking feeling that it was something God wanted me to share back home as well. And so uh, I think as I drove to church this morning and I got a text from Martin saying, I'm sick, I won't be preaching, I thought, man, Lord, is this, is this you setting me up? Um, so I, I don't think the Lord made Martin sick, but uh, <laughs> um, I do think perhaps this is an opportunity to share. And the, the rather uh, sort of convoluted title I have is The Goodness of God as the Foundation of of our worship in the ups and downs of life. The goodness of God, the foundation of our worship in the ups and downs of life. And um, you can tell I'm not an expert maker of titles, but that's kind of what was in my heart as I felt the Lord putting this message uh, for me to share with, with the girls at the Home of Blessing and I, I think for us here this morning as well. And it partly rose out of, and this is really what Jackie was touching on earlier, a sense that there's a, a lack of credibility in how I sometimes testify to the goodness of God. It seems to be that I testify to the goodness of God when life is good. God is good when my life is going well. But when things are difficult, it seems the goodness of God is seriously called into question. And I don't just mean a sense of, ooh, I wonder what he's up to, but Lord, where are you? And are you against me? And do you hate my guts? And are you trying to kill me? There's something in human nature that quickly gives up on that sense that God is consistently and always the same. We sing it in our songs. It's littered in our, in our uh, liturgy, in our theology. It's all over the place. We talk about it. You never change. You never fade. You're the same. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It rolls off our tongues, but is it actually embedded in our hearts? Or is it a nice intellectual position that we take? Uh, speaking personally, I have a feeling that it's more an intellectual position and it's, it's only growing and becoming, as I challenge myself to be a more mature Christian, it is growing and becoming more of a deep conviction. God is good all the time and that is unchanging. Let's look at some, of the, some scriptures to, to kind of understand this a bit more and if you, if you can reach a Bible, that will, um, it will help you because we'll look at a variety of scriptures A friend of mine, actually one of the young lads, he's from, uh, I want to say he's from Colombia. He's doing a DTS at Wyom Harpenden right now. He's on outreach, very close to his grandfather, who is in his, uh, I think, maybe mid-60s. And while he's been here in the UK, he's heard that, first of all, he heard his grandfather had terminal cancer. And then about three weeks ago, he heard his father, his grandfather had passed away. And there's... Part of us that thinks, well, that's life. People, people get sick and die, and, and that happens. But for this young lad, Robert, that's been like a kick in the guts. How could God let this happen? I'm here in England and you know, going to another nation on outreach. I'm trying to do God's will. And it seems like the person he's closest to in life has just been snatched from him while he's been here. And he didn't, wasn't in a position to, to fly home and see, see him while he was ailing. How can God be good in the face of that? or in the face of floods that have just swept across and may continue to sweep across our nation and ravage other parts of the world. You think of Philippines just a little while ago. Where is this good God in the face of those kind of things? Well, the scriptures teach us, and let's look at Romans chapter 8. It's kind of a classic, pivotal scripture about the goodness of God. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. You probably know it by heart. That's how well known it is. 
And I believe the Holy Spirit wants to make this more than just a verse we've memorized, but that it would be the cornerstone of faith in him. Romans 8, 28. Shall we read it together if you have? It doesn't matter what translation you have. Let's, let's read that verse together. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Let's read that again. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This is surely the clearest or one of the most clear statements in the whole of the Bible about the way that God arranges circumstances for the blessings of his people. He is always working for the good of those who love him in all things. But interestingly, and if you just cast your eye down a few verses later, uh, maybe it's around verse uh, 35 and 36 and 37 and 38, 39, those verses, there's this incredible list of hardships that we face. And in some ways, that's more true to life. We, we know that uh, people face these things, even good Christian people, people who love God, are trying to do his will. Famine, nakedness, persecution, hardship, danger, sword. You could add to that list sickness, all kinds of things. This is the normal experience in the Christian life. It does say that these things will not separate us from his love. So that's reassuring. He still loves me. But what are we to understand about the nature and character of a God who allows these things to happen and yet calls himself good, and says that he's always working for our good. How, how do we understand that? How can that be coherently understood in our lives? What well, seems to me that, to some extent, we have misunderstood the goodness of God to mean that the life of the Christian will never be marked by hardship or difficulty. And again, intellectually, you may, not know, that the, you, you may know that that's not the case. If someone asked you, you might say, yeah, for sure, difficult things will come to the life of the Christian. But when we actually experience it, I, I think we have a problem understanding that goodness of God does not mean we will not face hardships. The Bible is actually incredibly clear about the fact that Christians will have a pretty rotten life. And, and that's not an exaggeration. Psalm 34, verse 19. Uh, flick quickly to that. Psalm 34, verse 19, page 561, just the last bit of verse there. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. A righteous man may have many troubles. David, or whoever wrote that psalm, um, choosing that word may, <laughs> I think you could say the righteous man will have many troubles. There's no question about it. Uh, Jesus says it perhaps even more plainly in the book of John. Uh, John chapter 16. You don't have to turn to all of these, but if, if you're taking notes, John chapter 16 and verse 33, it says, In this world you will have trouble. That's a promise, like all of his other promises. That's a promise. You will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Take heart, be encouraged, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The Amplified Version, I, I like what it says here. It says, in the world you have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration. But be of good cheer, take courage, be confident, certain, undaunted, for I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of the power to harm. I have conquered it for you. So that's kind of the tension that's being set up in the scriptures. Being a Christian does not mean that bad things won't happen to us. That's clear from these verses we've looked at. What I think Romans 8 is saying, and this is the crux of that verse and many other verses like it, is that being a Christian means that God, the only one who is good, uniquely in all of the universe, who is genuinely in, in and of his very nature completely good, he is for us. He's got our back. He's fighting on our behalf. And, and as 
Jesus says there in John 16, he has overcome the world. So that definitely is of some comfort and encouragement that the good God, the God who is good, has put all of his power and his goodness to the work of caring for his people. Sinful people like us. People who don't deserve his care. People who should not in any way merit the care and concern in all of the minute details of our lives from this perfect God. But that is what he says and that is what he does doesn't mean that he causes all the bad things to go away or that they get uh, diluted in the life of the Christian. No. But we, unlike people who don't know God, we can have this confidence that God who is good is with us. He is in the fire with us. He is for us. Remember that story, and, and we refer to it a couple of times in, in Exodus chapter 33 and 34, where... Um, Moses goes up the mountain to meet with God. It's a very sacred moment. It's one of these clearest epiphany encounters that a human being has with God, where God seems to kind of come down and be in, in the company of a human being. This is before Jesus, obviously. And Moses is there, and he gets lots of instructions from God. While he's up there, he says to his assistant, Joshua, um, Joshua, I hear the sound of, of um, rejoicing and singing down in the camp. And Joshua is believing the best, and, and he's, he says, you know, perhaps they're rejoicing over something. And Moses, in his gut, in his spirit, knows that is not the sound of rejoicing. That's the sound of idol worship. And he comes down the mountain, having received these commandments that were the sacred law of God, and he finds that in those few days while he was away, the people have turned away from God, from Yahweh, and they are now worshiping a golden calf. And he's, he's furious, and he's devastated, and he's disappointed. He's everything you can imagine, leading these stubborn, difficult people to find that they, in a short time, have forsaken the God who's led them out into freedom. And he, you remember, he smashes the, the tablets on the ground, and, um, and, and, and he, he goes down, and, and there's this, you know, the, the Lord comes, and, and there's, there's um, a plague that kills some of them, and it's a terrible time. And actually, it seems to say in those verses that God is also really furious with the people. And he's irate, and he wants to move Moses out of the way and just strike them down. And Moses gets in the way of God and the people. It's one of those beautiful acts of intercession. And he stands in the gap, and he appeals to the goodness of God. This is one of the... the I suppose the theologically most packed occasions where we get to hear what the nature and the detail of God's goodness is. As God reappears to Moses uh, after that incident, after the anger and the disappointment and everything, it says that, that Moses asked to see God's glory. He wanted to see God's glory. He said, if you're going to be with us, I'd like to have a glimpse. If you're going to stay with us, stubborn, difficult people, please would you give me a glimpse of your glory? And God says something very interesting. He says, okay, Moses, I'll show you my glory. But what he actually says is, I'll show you, I'll cause my goodness to pass in front of you. And how I understand that, and I, I'm no expert in these things, but it seems to me that God is saying there that his very glory is his goodness. The thing that is glorious about God is that he is perfectly good. So if we were to want to trust in something about our God and what makes him glorious and, and surrounded in splendor and majesty, it is to believe and stand on the fact that he's good. He's good. I can trust in that because it is the mark of his glory. It's what distinguishes him from all the other gods, obviously. From us, we're not good. There's no one on earth who carries that level of goodness. But the thing that reveals God as uniquely majestic is that he is good, and that is what he caused to pass in front of Moses on that day. Our God is good. So what does it mean that he's good? Let's drill down into that, and, and here's a little scamper through a variety of verses to, to dig into that understanding of goodness. Because it, it's, in, I suppose in English, good is quite a, it's become quite a, a weak word. Oh, that was a really good time. What do you mean by that? 
Um, it could mean difficult but positive, or it could mean amazing and memorable for the rest of my life. It has so many meanings. So what does it mean in the Scriptures when it says that God is good? Well, Matthew 19, verse 17, uh, a classic statement by Jesus. He's asked, Matthew 19, 17, Uh, in verse 16, a man came up to Jesus and asked him, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter, eternal, uh, enter life, obey the commandments. So just tucked in that little story there is a profound statement by Jesus. There is only one who is good. So the first mark of the goodness of God that I want to pick out is that he alone is good. He alone is good. I've said that in different ways already, but he alone is good. Matthew 19, Jesus' own words state that. The second uh, aspect of his goodness, and, and we could probably identify lots from the scriptures, so I'm really just picking out a few that came to mind in the word. A second aspect is that he is slow to anger and he forgives. He is slow to anger and he forgives. That's what it means when it says he's good. So Psalm 25, verse 7. There's, there's many verses that say this in different ways, but Psalm 25, 7 says it well. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. And again, through our worship songs and, and the things that we declare in in Christian tradition, we've maybe become a bit casual about that. But that is absolutely mind-boggling. Just imagine, and I know you're a great crowd, but just imagine we could add together the sins of everyone in this room. I mean, in detail. All of the terrible attitudes, the bad words that we've spoken to others, maybe some serious sins, some failures of the, all of the Ten Commandments in great detail and we could plonk them in the middle of the room and ask Jesus to come in. I don't think there's any of us that would face him when he'd come in. We would hide our faces. We'd be probably sick to our stomachs, revolted by how evil we are. And yet it says, and it's like a throwaway statement, remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good. He is good, and it means that he doesn't hold on to our sins. If we will ask forgiveness, this is unique about Jesus. He died so that our sin would be taken away. Psalm 30, just a few verses on. Psalm 30, verse 5. Uh, another beautiful statement of his character. His anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Rejoicing comes in the morning. And that's just after a verse that says, Sing to the Lord, you saints of his. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. So going back to my title, if there's something that our, we should build our worship on in this church, in Christ Church Bushmead, it should be that our God is always good. He always forgives sin. There's none of us here who could come up with a sin that he would say, on this occasion, you're just too unforgivable. He always forgives sin. And his anger is just a momentary thing, but his favor is for a lifetime. That's incredible. A third aspect of the goodness of God is that he loves us and that his love never runs out. It's, it's like an unending, gushing torrent of love. We have to keep reminding ourselves of this because if you're anything like me, so often I feel like, okay, surely I've maxed out the love of God this time. Once again, I'm stubborn or difficult or giving my wife an unnecessary hard time or uh, not being compassionate to my children or whatever it might be. Psalm 33, we're, we're stuck in the Psalms here because David had revelation of the goodness of God. Psalm 33, verse 5. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full full of his unfailing love. Again, I'm no scholar, but that is, seems to me that's not rocket science. The whole earth is full of his unfailing love. Somehow in the very created order, he has set his love. He has set his favor 
towards the human race. And it's full. The earth is full, so it won't run out anytime soon. In fact, the scripture teaches us it will never run out. Uh, Psalm 136 says it quite plainly. Psalm 136, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Such a familiar phrase, isn't it? You just sing that. His love endures forever. It really does. It really does. The goodness of God is equal to permanent, present love from God for the human race. And you know what I've been thinking about it recently is that's not just for the believers. Isn't that beautiful? It's not just for his own. That river, that torrent of love is even for, uh, what's his name, Bashar al-Assad in Syria or Yanukovych in Ukraine or Hitler in times gone by. Whoever it might be, the most hated people on earth, the people that we think are just the epitome of evil, that same unfailing love, goodness, overflowing love of God is towards them as well. And so that's part of our act of worship as well, is the people of God declaring the love and goodness of God to a world that doesn't understand it, that doesn't know it. So our worship is not just this you know, amazing uh, vertical experience. It is also a message going out to the world. We worship a God who loves you, who is perfect in all his ways. And that perfection is not just for us to, to kind of um, enjoy and savor in our own private lives. That is for the whole world. The fourth aspect I want to bring out is the goodness of God uh, means that he is humble and faithful and righteous. I almost get embarrassed saying that God is humble. Surely that's not a good characteristic of a God uh, that we follow, but there's no other God like him. He is humble in all his ways. Psalm 25, verse 8. So he doesn't just call us to be humble because he's so mighty and powerful. He himself has modeled that and sets that as a pattern for us. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. He guides the humble. He is drawn near the humble. I was just reading the other day in the news that Viktor Yanukovych, the, the current about-to-be-deposed president of Ukraine, uh, his son and some of his family members are massive beneficiaries of his leadership. And they're creaming off you know, some of the best assets of the nation in terms of winning government tenders and so on. That's standard practice in government around the world, isn't it? The, power, the most powerful people favor those closest to them, find ways of giving backhanders and helping hands to those they love. Not our God. Most powerful being in the whole of the universe draws near the humble and the despised and the lowly. And it says he teaches them his way. That's what it means when we worship him as good. That's what it means when we say our God is humble and faithful and righteous. The fifth thing, and I, I think I just have six things to draw out. The fifth thing that we want, one of the many things that we mean when we say he's good, is that he is kind and generous. He's kind and generous. And I have a whole clatter of scriptures on this, but let's look at Psalm 145. I think it says it about as clearly as any other. Psalm 145, verses 7 to 9. That is on 631, page 631. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. So once again, that goodness is not just for the believers. That goodness extends to rain on the believing farmers and the unbelieving farmers. Unexpected provision for the person who hates him and has never acknowledged Jesus. Protection from uh, tragedy for those who have turned their backs on God. This is the word. We have to believe what it says. God is good to all he has compassion on all he has made. And so we must be the same. We must be people in whom compassion is a natural 
outworking of our Christian life. We're compassionate even to those who are not good, to those who are difficult. So our God is kind and generous. He's kind and generous. That, to me, is part of the template for my parenting, just really practically. If God is like that to me, how can I be like that for my children as well? That they would grow up to say, you know, Dad was many things, but he was kind and generous. He was kind and generous to us. Uh, The last thing I want to draw out is that his goodness means that he is the Savior and he cares for us. He's the Savior and he cares for us. Uh, Book of Nahum, I can't remember the last time I went to the book of Nahum, so (laughs) I will have to search for a moment. 938, thank you, Nigel. Nahum chapter 1 and verse 7. Nine, yeah, 937. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. So just going back to my friend Robert, 18-year-old guy, he's just taken a step of faith to come in his DTS, and here's his grandfather is unwell, and then here's he's passed away. This is what we can say for Robert. Robert, the Lord is good. He's a refuge for you in times of trouble. He cares for you who trust in him. And I want to speak that out to us as a church in the different hardships and difficulties you may be facing, whether it's some financial shortfall or unknowns about the future or difficulties with children or um, tragedy, bereavement, whatever it is. The Lord is good. He is a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. So let's flip back to that occasion, Exodus 34, that, that I was referring to earlier. Exodus 34, uh, Moses has gone back up the mountain. The Lord passes his go- causes his goodness to pass before him. And this is what he says. And he was not silent as he passed by Moses. It says, The Lord came down in the cloud and stood there. This is uh, chapter 34, verses 5 to 7. Page 93. He stood there and, uh, with, with Moses and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Notice in the next verse that Moses responds, was that he bowed down to the ground at once and worshipped. Having seen a glimpse, and he only saw God's back, it says that he didn't even see his face, but having seen a glimpse of God, the first thing that Moses could do, almost he couldn't help himself, was to throw himself on the ground and worship. If that is what our God is like, that is an, an unbelievable foundation for worship. The worship of God at Christ Church should be because the God we worship is slow to anger. He's compassionate, gracious, faithful, maintaining love, forgiving wickedness, and so much more. He had caught a, he had caught a glimpse of that goodness, and he responded in worship. Brothers and sisters, I believe that that response of Moses is to be a guide and a template for our whole lives, not just our sung worship, not just the times we come together as the people of God. But as I was saying earlier, Moses had just had a pretty horrendous failure of his own leadership and a turning away from God of the people that he was leading. And his right-hand man, Aaron, was leading the charge. (laughs) He had gathered in the gold, thrown the gold in a fire, and claimed that a golden calf had jumped out. Even when Aaron had um, turned away, In that moment, Moses had a deep revelation of God's goodness. As the mercy of God began to flow towards the people, 
and as, as mercy was literally triumphing over justice because the justice in God's character was causing him to, to, to want to blot the people off the face of the earth. But it's one of those incredible moments where his own mercy trumped his justice. I love that about our God, that he's not in a set of rules where his justice wins out every time, but his, he is just, he's consistently just, but his mercy triumphed over justice. And rather than obliterating them from the face of the earth, he heard Moses' prayers and he met with Moses and he gave the, the most stark revelation of who he is that had been given in the Bible up to that point. He revealed his glory, he revealed his nature, he revealed his character. So circumstances had not improved for Moses. It was still a horrendous time. And answers had not been provided for those hard questions. Why am I failing? Why are the people turning away? Why is, why is God being so tough on me when I'm trying to lead these people and it's going all wrong? But Moses saw God for the first time for who he really is. And so like Moses, we worship God because he is good. And we worship him because he alone is good. And we worship him because he's worthy to be worshipped all the time. All the time. You know that, that slightly cheesy th thing that we say, God is good all the time, all the time God is good. It's cheesy because most cheesy things we say are true. They're cliched because they're true statements that have been said over and over again. All the time he's good. He never changes, even in the really, really, really rough times. Even in the very difficult times, circumstances change. You can't get away from that. I think about my own dad's passing away in 2012. It was coming up on two years ago. And, and we prayed like the blazes. I mean, honestly, we prayed so many prayers. And hundreds of people were praying for him. Now, are we weak in faith or inadequate amount of prayer? Lord knows. I have no idea. I can't figure out my theology from that experience. But what I do know is that the question, the temptation... When he died, relatively peacefully in his sleep, the question was, Lord, where the heck are you? We prayed. We did the thing you ask of us. We ticked that box, that spiritual ingredient. We prayed and prayed and prayed. And why has he passed away? He just followed the normal course of the sickness he had, deteriorating over about five years, eventually dying. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that at all. Jesus said, in this world you will have many, uh, what did he say, hardships, troubles, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer, that doesn't change my character. Be of good cheer, I am good. Be of good cheer, even if it's miserable, I'm with you. And I love the fact that he said, at the end of the Great Commission, he said, oh, and by the way, I'm with you always even to the end of the age. So it's not a promise to fix everything, although he does fix so many things. And that's what a lot of our testimonies are often about. God provided this, or God came through with this, or God did this. And we need to give those testimonies because they are reminders to us of the intervening work of God. But even when things are tough and they don't get fixed, he, the good God, is with us in the trial. And his goodness is not driven by our circumstance but it's his unchanging and majestic character. And that's why we should worship him. How we should worship him. How we should worship him. How we should worship him.